Okie dokie. Let's get started. Three chapters to cover today. Uh, the first two are a part one, part two. The last one is a part one, and part two will be next week. So these first two chapters will cover all about storage and file systems. A lot of this is repeat from the, uh, the prior sections that we covered. So it won't be too bad. It is the, the focus won't be on Windows desktop. It'll be on server, of course. So the topic that will cover two thirds of this conversation is first storage and uh, what storage is and how it's used in the Windows environment. Uh, primarily Windows will use storage like hard drives and SSDs as your main storage. Uh, you might from time to time need to use other medium, but storage is anything where you can store data. Like I said, primarily, uh, if you want to use, if you want to have cheap storage, you'll use a spinning disk. Otherwise, you'll go with a solid state. Because as far as I know, uh, solid states are still not uh, comparable to the spinning drives. Now, here are some suggestions for storage. Your uh, your page file could uh, could ideally be within the the solid state drive if you if you have a mix of disks you could do something like that. Uh, there's other things that are more long term and those could easily be within a spinning disk. That you have kind of the the basic items of what you were, you would see in a typical system uh, that's serving up storage for others to use. Now this could be either local storage or direct access direct attached or DAS, you have your NAS and your and your SAN. The local storage as defined in the Windows world is anything that's already inside the computer case. Doesn't refer to any optical drive or anything uh, that is externally connected like USB. Whereas direct attached storage can be uh, things like a USB or can be RAID and any other items like that. Your network attached storage, working from another system, offering that storage through things like server message block, the network file system or file transfer protocol. Mind you, all three are by default insecure so you want to use secure methods to communicate your storage especially if you're handling confidential secret or top secret level information your sin is a high speed network version of their of your nas communicates through typically through things like fiber channel or iSCSI and they have a logical unit number or a LUN to identify themselves. And this could be an entire array of disks, just a single disk, or even parts of a disk. Here we kind of have the, just a picture set up. All of our clients would be using local or direct access storage, depending on how they're configured. Each of their own servers could have local storage and you have the SAN that these three would share. And you could have things like replication and migration occurring amongst these two. And because you know their SANs using uh, higher speed networks, they would probably have their own backbone or have their own ports on the switch separated from everything else. As you saw with Windows, with Windows 10, you have your basic disk storage terminology of a disk drive, a volume, a partition, and formatting, and the difference between a physical and logical disks. Things seen in A plus are hard drives or spinning drives, 
still are able to have more data stored within them at a cheaper price. It does come down to the speed. Great for long-term storage. Whereas an SSD is great for normal use and, and high-speed data transfers. Add some RAID into that and it'll go even faster. Your disk interface is how the physical disk connects with the rest of the computer or the rest of the, of the board, if in case it's we're talking about a SAN or a NAS. Your three most typical are SATA, SAS, and SCSI. SAS is serial attached SCSI, if you didn't know. Your serial ATA drives have been around for a while. Uh, they replaced the old parallel ATA, the ribbon cable. We can handle up to 16 gigabits per second with most devices being SATA 3, because that's the current standard. Uh, SCSI has been around for quite some time and it, it's gotten an upgrade through serial attached SCSI. Uh, a SAS disk and a SATA disk almost look identical. The K, if you don't pay attention, the two cables will look identical to each other, but there actually is a small difference between the two. Here's some added cables to the, to the SAS than SATA. We have our volume. And the two definitions that are in the realm of Microsoft, the boot volume where Windows lies and the system volume or the system partition. This is not assigned. This is the one that's not assigned a drive letter. So here we have the system and here's the boot. This is what the UEFI will look at and boot from before uh, jumping over to this. Again, it's all the same stuff that we've seen with Windows 10, since the two function pretty much the same way. There's a lot of repetition in this. We have our basic disks with partitions within them, the primaries and extended. All current Windows OSs use the GUID partitioning table since it can handle up to 18 exabytes. If you're creating VMs in the cloud, you will have systems built off of this by default. Older systems will use MBR. If you've ever wondered about the disk sector size, how you can change it? Well, this is pretty much what it is. It's just how the disk is divided up. How, uh, what is the smallest unit of chunk for information? So it could be as small as 512. It could be as large as 4096 bytes, depending on what kind of information you're gonna have. This will affect backups as well when we get into that later. This quick little command will show you the basic information. You can always get this information off of this management as well. It's not restricted to just the command line. We have our different kinds of volumes, our simple, our spanned that goes across two disks, our striped, and then we have the, mirror, the raid essentially. So the first couple can be done natively within Windows. These can be done within Windows or used like a hardware card. 
Next item on the list, like I said, it's kind of repetition from the prior. You have the three main file systems used in Windows. And knowing that uh, one of the three is the one that's most used yet hasn't been updated in forever and a day. Starting with the archaic FAT file system, no security whatsoever. So if you need to store sensitive and higher level information, you don't want to store it in FAT at all. It also can only handle up to four gigs in size, any files. NTFS has been around since 2000. Has a couple more features, but like I said, it hasn't had quite the updates like uh, EXT4 and uh, all the other formats that have been around recently. The new one in the Windows family the resilient file system should be the one used in large file sharing applications. So if we're making a file server, ideally you want to use REFS to share disks. It is not meant to replace NTFS. So if you want to implement REFS, you're going to have to have a separate drive. You can't just replace it. Can't replace NTFS with this. But it works great for storage spaces and Hyper-V. New disks can be hot added while the system is on. Server is able to handle this without freaking out. Any brand new disks have to be initialized like they do in any operating system. And then you can add a volume and format and do all that kind of stuff with it. Uh, as you have seen already, you don't need to depend on just the GUI. You need to be able to do everything within PowerShell as well, which is why we spent those weeks in PowerShell. So here are some commands to do this kind of stuff within PowerShell. You know, uh, if we're going to format the volume, its letter, the type of file system, and any label that you want to add to it. Virtual disks, well, specifically Microsoft virtual disks, are able to communicate within the Windows environment natively. Your VHD and VHDXs can work. Anything that's VMware or uh, outside of that realm, you'll need to have a tool in order to read the, the disk within. As covered before, VHDX is the newer generation of virtual disk file and can handle more than the VHD. It is possible to convert a VHD disk into VHDX, so if, if you are importing an older image, you can upgrade it. Here are some pictures that go with the stuff we just talked about where you would hit edit disk on a certain VM and convert it. Because virtual disks are nothing more than a file, it is totally possible to expand or fix size for the disks. Uh, dynamic is typically the better way to go because it grows as needed. So you're able to have multiple virtual drives and have them work in tandem with each other. Fixed disk is good for things like databases. So if you're building a database VM, you ideally want to use a fixed size because both the read writing of the database and storage, that can, that can cause some problems later down the line. Um, switching gears into file sharing. 
something that you can add in the file and storage service role. The default for Windows sharing is the server message block or SMB. Make sure that if you are installing a, a file sharing that SMB is up to date because there's a lot of vulnerabilities that exist for server message block. Windows Server also handles NFS, so it's possible to use a NFS storage system with multiple operating systems together, like VMware or Linux. All right, you see the message in the chat? Yeah, one, a one terabyte SSD around 80 to 150, depending on SATA versus NVMe, a one terabyte hard drive, 45 to $90. That, yep, they're cheaper. They're just not that cheap. Um, as you saw with Windows 10, the same thing applies in server on the simple file sharing and, and uh, the options that exist, it's nothing different. It's the same wizard that you would see in Windows 10 with the more advanced permissions to uh, modify. Here's where things start uh, differentiating between the desktop and the server. In the server, you have a different wizard with different options like sharing through SMB or sharing NFS. You can create, you can choose one of these profiles to share folders on the network. Here are some additional options that again, you don't see in Windows 10, but you do in server, like enumeration, caching of share, encrypting data access. Which of course they should be on, especially for handling sensitive data. And the default is read only for everyone. So this does mean, while this means that anyone and everyone can read, it also means you don't need to be authenticated. You don't have to have a username password in order to see the contents of the files and folders. So this default should actually be changed when you set up a permission because otherwise everyone, including malicious people or a software like a worm or a virus will be able to read that data. And if within that piece of malware is a form of spyware uh, or any form of data exfiltration, well, it just needs read in order to copy out information. Here you can set your permissions. And again, by default, it'll be everyone read only. You should change this. Don't just let that go. The shared folder snapping from the MMC gives you some information. For example, all the shares that exist, how many clients are connected, uh, what files are being opened by who, which becomes harder if you have something like everyone, because then it may not be able to keep track, especially those anonymous connections. So you want to switch it to at least authenticated users. Just like with the GUI, you can also see the similar information through the command line and through PowerShell more commands to be familiar with, but also uh, having something like SS64 and other uh, reference sites handy. The default shares that you should be aware of, the admin dollar sign, drive dollar sign and IPC dollar sign will always show up whenever you are working within Windows. 
uh, the admin dollar sign. The dollar sign is used as a, a character to hide the folder or hide the share. So if you make a, a new share and you put a dollar sign at the end, the, uh, the share will quote unquote disappear, but you'll still be able to get to it through the either the IP address or the FQDN. There is a share, a default share for every drive that you have. So for example, if you go to your uh, local IP address and you, and you do the slash C dollar sign, you'll get the contents of your hard drive. If you have multiple drives connected, you should you should be able to see the contents by going D dollar sign, E dollar sign, so on and so forth. Domain controllers will have netlogon and sysvol also shared. These are necessary as part of running the domain. Some common ways to share folders besides giving users the path or being able to search their active directory, you can always map uh, or browse the network or add it in group policy so that the user doesn't have to do a thing. It'll just show up to them when the policy updates. Talked a bit about the network file system and coming back to that. Again, it's a native file sharing system found in Linux systems. And Windows can also communicate uh, with this as long as it has a client, which is available as a feature. So it's not, it can't read NFS in a clean install. You have to add this feature. Once you install it, like any other role service, you'll be able to connect or create an, an NFS share with your network. You see over here the, uh, the various options that you have, like if you want to tie it with Kerberos, if you want to allow unmapped users by, uh, for Unix access, or if you just want anonymous access. To implement, you'll need a data store. This will be uh, the share that is available through NFS. Without the role, you won't be able to do any of this. Once it's there, you can configure an NFS data store. Just as with everything, it's all possible to do through PowerShell. To secure access, because there's way too many misconfigured systems out and about, you want to protect your data so you want to enable things like permissions, both for the share itself and the files and folders within uh, this share. Some basic security principles that you see in like security plus and beyond having access control lists, defining who the owners are and using either the system access control list or various other forms of access control lists to lock down who has access to what data. Here is discretionary access. There's also mandatory. Uh, there's a number of different access control lists that you can apply. Your object owner is usually the person who creates it or the person or group who are assigned ownership of the object that contains data that is relevant, that is sensitive, that is secret to our organization, to us. The typical way to assign permissions after the user creates that object, it can get permissions off of the user who created it or also by group. You can also do effective permissions to see what, what permissions are affecting what file or what folder. Your share permissions are, are similar. 
While you can't configure on individual files, you can do these three, read, change, and full control. Obviously, you don't want to just do full control across the board. You want to be much more specific as to who can read and who can change or read and write. Once again, note that the default share in Windows is read for everyone, authenticated and unauthenticated. So here's your basic permissions for a share. Digging deeper into the file and folder permissions. Your basic ones are read, read, execute, list the folder contents, write, modify, full control. List folder contents and read are not the same because this will just show you what's within a folder. It won't actually let you read the contents of a file. So if you just have this enabled, you'll be able to only list the contents and nothing more. So would that be similar to like what they use in Linux as far as like the ls dash la or um, dash a command? Right. Got it. Thank you. All right. With that, with uh, this, it's basically just ls, but I can't cat the file. I can't open it. I can't write to it. It's just listing what's in there. Okay. Every file has a owner, whether it is the system, a user, the administrator, every file has an owner. And each owner has their implicit permissions that come within, you know, if you set it up through Active Directory or you set up locally. Though those owners can affect the file system and who can create a file or folder who can take ownership or assign ownership. Because it could be that a user creates a file, but then uh, needs to transfer to another person to be the custodian of that file. So they change the ownership. Because that person will manage the permissions and, and whatnot. You just created it, input it the data, move on. Permission inheritance, something that we covered in the Windows 10 section. Everything starts from the root. Whatever permissions are set at the root affect all the other folders within. You can disable permission inheritance within the advanced security settings. Otherwise, whatever you have set up at the root drive will affect every folder and every subfolder and files that exist. Which again, this all depends on uh, what, what you're working with. Uh, your effective access is, uh, here we go. The effective access can show you the effects for a user or a group or a device. So if you want to test uh, what can a specific user see. So in this case, we have test user. And that test user does not have full control, does not have right attributes, can't create folders, can't create files, but they can read attributes, they can list what's in there and they can also go through any subfolders and execute any files. But it looks like they can't write. So they can do LS in Linux and they can execute and read any data. Looks like that's about it. So if you wanna test permissions out, this is a great way to do so. Any denies if you're using the access control, 
any denies override allows. Usually it's the other way around where deny is the last in the list. Windows treats it opposite because Windows. There is a small exception. If a deny is inherited from the parent object, then the allow is explicitly added. But normally as a rule, the deny overrides the any allow permissions. Here's a couple more that we have covered before. For example, if you move anything from FAT to NTFS, it will gain whatever uh, permissions exist in the destination folder. If you do it in reverse, uh, FAT strips away any of the, the permissions because FAT has no place for permissions. And that is the end of that chapter. Any questions? Looking at the chats, looking at the chats. Cool. So let's hit 